So our second panel for today is on work-life balance. Uh, great timing. Uh, looking at your number eight on the list of things you suggested for us. Um, and we decided that Linda had to stay on stage with us because she just has too much experience with this topic as she exhibited. Um, we are also welcoming back Roz Alford, the chair of the C200 Foundation, also founder and principal of ASAP Solutions. Sally Walker Guthrie, the chairman of the Clearwater Base Manufacturing Company, JT Walker Industries, also joins us here in the red chair. And I'm told Sally's also a cattle rancher. Maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. Um, but thank you all for being with us today and taking the time to speak on this panel. So our first question is, based on your experiences, what do you see as the main barriers for women entering into STEM fields? Well, I'm a dinosaur, um, and I, Linda, I, I brought this bag up here because I thought maybe this oh, no. would be familiar to y'all, just to prove my dinosaur cred. Ladies, do you know what this is? I did this at UCLA at the engineering school, and they didn't know. Wow. So, Can I see your slide rule? Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I still have mine, by the way. So. And I have mine. So. Uh. And based on my experiences as a dinosaur, let me tell you that the ancient history about women in engineering is prejudiced. When I was a student in the 1960s, there were so few women at Georgia Tech that they were domiciled in one ramshackle old house on campus, <laughs> and they were referred to as the co-odds because oh, wow. <laughs> women shouldn't had no place in engineering. What I currently see is that there are not enough women in the field. And, yeah, and yeah, thank you cool. very much. Thank you very so, much. <laughs> Can I make you feel better? I think one of the issues that we have, though, is that um, we don't have enough, there aren't enough role models out there for young women in the career, and that starts at a really early age, I think. It starts in the middle schools to get these young women, young girls, really um, involved and excited about engineering. And that, that seems, I know in my generation, I am also a dinosaur, that didn't happen. Um, but today we all have opportunities. And I think one of the biggest opportunities, I mean, I know I speak everywhere, um, regard on behalf of STEM and, and women in engineering and in technology. But I think that, you know, young women don't want to just hear it from dinosaurs like us. <laughs> they want to hear it from you as well. And I think this is where you get back to that generation, that, that future generation, so that we can get more people, more young women involved. It, it is true. I mean, if you don't capture the hearts and minds of women, and, and young men too, by the way. We yeah. need more engineers and other technology fields than we have you know, people coming through the pipeline right now. So we need women and men to come into, this, into these fields more than they, than they currently are. And these curriculums, as you all know, are, are hard. So how do we encourage kids when they're eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, to want to go down this path so they take the right classes in, in high school so that they can come to a university and take the kind of classes you have to take here. Because if you don't get the math and science in high school, you don't have a prayer when you come to college. And so we really do need to find more ways to, to get the interest at, at, at the younger age groups. And that's why volunteering in schools and, and bringing kids to work and, and doing fun things that makes this something other than the nerdy type description that was earlier put forth, that it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating and cool to be in technology one way or another. Yeah, and I just wanted to add one thing. I think that it is important. It's not, I mean, we are all women in here. We have a few men that are here as well, but women in engineering. I think that, I think Linda just said it, it it's not just women. We need to get both our young men involved as well so that, I mean, we, it's not going to work otherwise. We have to get everybody involved. 
Yeah, the, the flow of your conversation is perfect because that's what our next question really involves. So it's asking what can society do to promote and inspire women to enter STEM fields? And then also very specifically, what role can men play in encouraging women to pursue STEM fields? And as you were mentioning, the need for retention. So how can they play a role in the workforce in encouraging women to remain in STEM fields? Well, as a former first grade teacher in one of my previous lives, um, I couldn't agree with you more about education. And there are some books that are, there's some promising little there sprouts. Are. There, Rosie Revere Engineer is a book for young girls. Um, there's a company, a woman-owned company in California called Goldie Blocks. Yeah, and great. they uh, have things, I think Legoland uh, encourages a lot of not technical things as much as building block things, but um, education. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, Goldie Blocks is a great example. I've had the, the privilege of hearing that the founder of Goldie Blocks speak, and I bought them for my granddaughters, and it's a great way to you know, kind of level the playing field. Toys traditionally have been a, a real promoter of stereotypes. And when girls and boys learn to play in similar ways, they grow up with different expectations and different types of, um, of views of themselves. And, and I was fortunate, I have a brother, and I don't know, it seems like we were always in the yard playing sports, you know, building forts in the orange groves and doing various things. And um, my parents never pushed a gender stereotype on, on me. And I think it's important that men can help us. What I find is some of the most amazing supporters of diversity amongst my male colleagues are the men who have daughters, who want their daughters to be treated fairly. And they finally understand that it hasn't been a level playing field. And they become very committed and outspoken in supporting diversity, not just for women, but diversity in general, because they are now living it in their daily lives with the aspirations and hopes of their daughters. So I often seek out men that I know have daughters coming along and try and co-opt them into the idea of supporting initiatives in the business to help promote diversity. Um, of course, looking for colleagues that have you know, similar different backgrounds, whether it be African American or other ethnicities or people with disabilities or from different economic strata. Yeah, you can work this diversity thing from many, many different angles to the benefit of the organization. I think um, also, you know, we've got to get media, obviously, um, on the same path that we're on and thinking the way you very seldom see women in technology or engineering ever talked about in the media. Um, I think that's something, again, I think that has to do with the role models, that there aren't a whole lot of them. There are a lot of women that are role models, but I don't think that they are publicized as much. We all, women, as women, tend to downplay what we've done, and I think that in some cases that's hurt us a little bit, but I think media has to get on board, obviously, as well um, for, for us to you know, move forward. So more on the note of um, specifically balancing this work-life balance that we're trying to really kind of get more integrated into, um, what in your careers have you prioritized? And have you ever been criticized for the decisions you've made, whether it has been more so family, career, um, whatever it was at that time period? Mine changed with age. At first, I was so driven, that was all I did. And then I started to get old. <laughs> and if you live in the town where you grew up, um, eventually, it's inevitable, the parents of your friends start to die. And so I started reading the obituaries because that was my social outlet. That was the one social outlet I had was going to Moss Funeral Home. <laughs> and, um, and I started, you know, being an analytical kind of person, um, reading the, kind of analyzing the obituaries. And just um, in the Tampa Bay Times on Sunday, there were 82 paid obituary notices. Of those 82 notices, only 21, or roughly 25.65%, mentioned what the deceased had done for a living. 
but every single one of them mentioned the family. So I think to your That's point, you have to integrate your life and prioritize what's important at that time. Well, I certainly agree with that. Um, life is full of choices and that means making priority decisions. Uh, as I've gotten old, I'm still driven, but not quite as driven as I was in my 20s and 30s. Um, I, I had a child and was criticized, of course. I mean, I, back then, it, more women stayed home than worked, and I was actually quite awed, and I heard about it from everybody, you know. Um, that was making bad choice, wrong thing for my family. How can you possibly, you know, do this? Well, first of all, frankly, I loved my daughter dearly and loved her then, but I did not want to stay home. I wanted to work and do what interested me, and I believed that if I was fulfilled and I had what time I had was quality time with her, that was far better than resenting having to, to stay home. And, and I'm not sure I would have had a child had the trade-off been I had to stay home to do it. It just wasn't in me. And so the, the kinds of choices I recall when my daughter was young were more along the how do I accommodate both things that I want to do. How do I have a very demanding career? And I, I'm divorced now, but I was married then. Uh, so it was like, you, you really can't do the housework and be the star chef and, and all the kinds of things that we were, at least I was raised to do. And, and so it meant hiring help and admitting that some days I, the house wasn't going to be as clean as it should be and that a little chaos here and there was, was just fine. And, you know, it's interesting. My daughter will tell you today that there were years she felt like she had an absentee mother. But you know what? We both grew up and got through it, and she developed into a lovely uh, woman, has three children of her own, married to a terrific guy, and is my biggest fan. So, you know, you really can get through. Kids are awfully resilient. And I know my daughter is proud of her mother, and I think she was proud of me all along, even when she wished I was at home and I wasn't. So, I, I'm, For me, it's very similar to Linda. I mean, almost identical. Um, you know, you make the choices. I, I wanted a career. Um, I wanted a child, obviously, as well. But I think that my, I, I once went to um, a counselor and said to me, because I, I felt a little guilty, you know, was I so driven that I wasn't spending as much time, and, and um, especially in the height of your career when you're really trying to, you've got to put in 80 hours a week there. It wasn't like I could work only 20 or 25, but I chose it. It was my choice. And I remember the doctor saying to me, Roz, it's not quantity of time that you spend, but you better make sure that the quality is there. And I remember that, and I, even today, I think about it all the time, you know. And my son now, um, you know, he's, he's 37. He's the CEO, COO of my company. Um, when I, I went back about, this was about two years ago when I was talking to somebody and I said, well, you know, I worked from home. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. When I started out, I started from my home. And I said, you know, I made arrangements that I was there and everything. And, you know, so Chris, my son Chris, I said, you know, he was never without a, a, a parent, right? And, um, and, I had a, and I had a good spouse. I had a very supportive spouse. But at that time, in those, in the early, in those days, 30 years ago, or 35 years ago, 40 years ago, keeps going on. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where. Spouses weren't as, I mean, right now, spouses or partners really work hard, and it's a, it's a shared um, dual environment. It didn't used to be like that. And women kind of had to take on a lot for themselves. But, but what I'm getting at is Chris said to me, you know, Mom, I don't know why you keep saying that this was such a perfect light, you know, you did it, you did everything. He says, all I remember, Mom, is you, we were on the phone 24-7. You may have been home, but you were on the phone. Yeah. 
And, um, you know, and then later on, you know, you're on your devices and what have you. So, you know, I, I, I think back to the quality. Now, I think that having a son, my son has always wanted to, um, he's always been, in, was in search of a woman that kind of was like his mom. You know, and it was hard to find somebody that was so driven, right? My son, find, he's 37, he's going to be 38. He just got married in April, so it took him a whole long time to find that person. And I had to say, you know what? Times are different today, and I was so driven, I think, at that time. Um, I might make a, do things a little bit different, but I said, you know, you don't have to be looking for a copy of me and, and make different choices. You know, one of the interesting things for me is, is early on I expected my daughter to be like me, and she could not be more different than uh, me, though there are some shades of similar uh, bullheadedness at times. And um, she's married to a Marine, and he's been deployed many, many times in the last decade, so she can't work. She's got three kids, and they can't afford child care for three kids kids and the necessary arrangements. So she has been a full-time mother during the bulk of, of their marriage because they really didn't have any other options. Now the kids are getting older and now she's beginning to, to think about, now what do I do with my time? But it took me a while to realize it was okay that my daughter wasn't like me. And we're very close and, and just terrific friends and um, but that was my problem, not hers, on, on how, you know, we kind of evolved together. And I think the main thing, too, is you've got to find a partner if, you know, that, that if you are in a relationship that is very supportive. And, and without that, um, you know, you're, the, the relationship doesn't work. And, it, it, you know, it, it, it can't, you can't succeed either. I mean... It, yeah, my, my husband was very supportive as well. I was married for 25 years before I got divorced. Uh, and it, had he not picked up a lot of the slack, it would have been more difficult. So all three of you have mentioned some sort of pullback or criticism that you either experienced from society, from when you were in school, or even kind of your own criticizing of how you're just from what society expects of you, am I doing this correctly? So how did you kind of push through and make sure you were making the best decisions for where you were in that moment? Or what advice would you give to those of us who are getting ready to take on those challenges? Be true to yourself. I, th I think you, th you said it beautifully earlier. Know yourself and do what's right. If for me, interestingly enough, it was moving to California. That was my aha moment. Uh, living in the South back in the early 70s and trying to make it as a female engineer was, was tough. I mean, there were times, <clears throat> I've used the word that I felt like a freak. I mean, there was nobody else like me. And my, um, my husband had grown up in Southern California and wanted to move back to California, so we moved to California. And social norms in California in the 70s were very different than social norms in the South <laughs> in those days. And so for me, it was like, oh my, you know, I'm not as much a freak as I thought I was. There were, there were other people doing similar things and it was just an environment that was so much more open and welcoming that, I mean, I just saw it firsthand when you create an environment that embraces difference and doesn't judge you because you're different, how much more effective and happy and successful you can be. So I don't suggest everybody go run and move to California, but for me, it, it really did take moving to an environment that was far more tolerant in those days than, than the South was. I think today we certainly have the opportunity in this part of the country to do many things we didn't do then. And, and there's a reason I'm back in the South, so uh, I like it here. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think making decisions, you know, it's, uh, for me, I know that even from early on when I made a decision to do something, um, I was very tenacious. And I didn't, you know, I would do all that I could to not have that decision fail. 
Um, you know, there were times that I did fail, and you know, but I, I know for me, I made a decision and I would stand by it, good, bad, or ugly. And um, this is not, you know, my dad. So this is no pun intended. My dad used to call me the general because I would, I, I ran my entire family. I told them what to do, how to do it, and you know, and I would never veer from that what I thought was right. So I think, um, I think Shelley said this there. You know, you come up with an idea and you want to make, you want a decision. If you don't really follow through with it, somebody else is going to come with it and take credit for doing it. So, you know, you just, again, it's confidence and not being afraid to fail. I think the most important part is that, well, for me anyway, is when you make a decision, you think, oh gosh, this is not going to work, and you talk yourself out of it. So I don't ever do that. I look at it the other way and keep saying, okay, we're, how do I go to the next step? This is what I've decided, and I try to go through with it. Awesome. So um, you, you actually mentioned, Linda, in your talk about how women who do leave STEM fields, 30% of them are saying it's because they don't feel supported. Um, so have you felt supported by coworkers and superiors when prioritizing family and personal time? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be quite honest, no. I mean, it was... It was really never supported during the course of my oh. my career. And in fact, if it ever, I think it was on your panel, if it ever came into the workplace, forget about it. So you didn't talk about your family, you didn't let personal issues in the door. It was all business. And if there was a hint that your personal life was interfering with your business life, you were you done. Were yeah. And so, I mean, the workplace has evolved I think today from then, but as a CEO, there wasn't a lot of tolerance of letting the personal world come into to my world. It, it's, I mean, 40,000 people were depending on what I did, and I, it was hard to, you know, to just disappear or get away or, or whatnot, so. Um, I mean, I think it's far better today, but I didn't have the opportunity to experience that. Yeah, and I think we're all, you know, I agree totally. I think that, I mean, I, I know that even um, in my family, I mean, going into kind of, I have to tell you, I was not into technology at all. I just, it was an opportunity that happened. I'm a linguistics major. I was a liberal arts student. I went to the University of Chicago with all of the techies and engineers and nuclear physicists and what have you, you know, one of 60, of 60 women there at the time in my classes. But I, you know, I happened upon IT, um, I, you know, and I remember that, um, you know, I was hired at Kraft Foods. I worked there for 10 years when they were just developing and starting a data processing department. And I fell into it and they said, hey, how would you like to go back to school? And um, actually, I think I recommended it. I said, you know, you're going to need, we have to talk the lingo. We're going to have to understand the systems. Somebody needs to go back to school and then I got the opportunity and they you know they paid to send me back to the University of Illinois but I remember when I first told my folks my parents about it they said I, I you know why would you give why would you want to do that and there's you know it was you know going into technology what are you talking about you know there's so many other things you you could be doing so you're you're criticized I, I found for me is I when I was at Kraft, I sought out difficult assignments that nobody else wanted in the technology field and figured out how to work them and solve it. And, and that's how I moved you know, forward in my career. And, and because I, they worked, luckily, the things that I did, um, I gained credibility and trust. And then the issue wasn't there as much about criticism because if you're good at what you do, you're going to be accepted. And um, I came into a family business that my father was going to give to my brother. And this family business was not working out too well. And um, so I uh, 
Claire Booth Luce got her first job by just showing up. So I just started to show up. And uh, my brother had not been accepted in the Ivy League schools. Of course, they didn't accept women at that time. Yeah. But it turns out that you can pay these people and they will let you come to executive education. So I went to Harvard <laughs> Business School for two weeks and my father thought that he didn't, he didn't realize my mother was paying this exorbitant <laughs> amount of money. And I went to Stanford for business school, um, GSB, for two weeks. And um, it kind of got his attention. But if you talk about unsupported, we, at the time um, I came into the company, the revenues were substantial, but we increased it five times by the time my father died. And what he would say to me was, tell me about my son. So it, it, it's always, no matter what, whether it's your family or, or your coworkers, it's just something you have to put on your big girl pants and deal with. <laughs> Now, now, having said that, I, I was never supported. I worked really hard to create an environment in my company that was extremely supportive of, um, of, of my workforce, both men and women. I refused to implement policies that just applied to, to women. If it was good enough for our female employees, it was also good enough for our male employees. Uh, you know, dads want to go to soccer games, too. And, and so we... Whatever we did in the family-friendly arena, it applied across the board. And I, I think that's the right way to do it. If you start having separate employment policies for women versus men, you're only furthering the divide and creating more differences rather than bringing people together. And, and I, um, just because I didn't have the benefit of experiencing it, that does not mean that I don't think it's a healthy thing in the work environment to be far more supportive. Well, I, I mean, I saw firsthand we had better productivity. We had better retention. We had more uh, employee satisfaction you know, when people felt like they could have a life and work at the same time. But the standards for performance were never lowered. You know, people just had to do things a little bit differently. Awesome. Well, uh, that concludes uh, this panel. I want to thank you all again for participating. This was a great conversation.